This film is one of the greatest films of the classic universal horror era, released only days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the United States entering World War II. This film presents a cautionary tale that mirrored the Nazis' rise in Germany. With a mostly sympathetic monster, this movie shows how a good man can easily be transformed into a deadly monster. The effects in the movie were relatively simple, but were filmed and edited in a way that produced maximum impact. The movie was a progenitor of many horror films featuring the same monster. However, much of the lore around this creature was created by this film. Even a man who is pure at heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolfbane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on The Wolfman, 1941. The beautiful little poem that I just read is recited several times in The Wolfman, 1941. It is said to have Eastern European folk roots. However, famed writer Kurt Siodmak wrote it for this film, and it has joined the werewolf lore, as have many other elements from this movie. The poem, be it somewhat changed, was quoted in Van Helsing, 2004, as well as in every other universal film that the Wolfman appeared in. The film is rated a much too low 7.2 on imdb.com. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film has a much more realistic 91% on the tomato meter and an 80% audience score, so pretty good. Film critic Leonard Maldon called The Wolfman 1941, quote, one of the finest horror films ever made, unquote. Actors. The Wolfman had an all-star cast by any standards. Patrick Knowles, known for The Charge of the Light Brigade, 1936, The Adventures of Robin Hood, 1938, The Wolfman, 1941, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, 1943, and The Unrequited Love in Auntie Mame, 1958, was Gwen's fiance, Frank Andrews. In Auntie Mame, Rosalind Russell is fabulous, and she takes you on an emotional roller coaster while making you laugh at the same time. But whatever you do, don't watch the MAME 1974 starring Lucille Ball and B. Arthur. Remember that once the time is lost, you can never get it back. Knowles was briefly covered in Chisholm 1970, the links below, where he was in the role of Harry Turnstall. Warren Williams played the role of Dr. Lloyd. He was first covered in Satan Met a Lady 1936. The film was an early version of the Maltese Falcon 1941. William played a quirky version of the role that Humphrey Bogart would later make famous. Lon Chaney Jr. played the role of Lawrence Talbert, also known as Larry and as the Wolfman, although they never call him the Wolfman in this movie. I've always enjoyed Chaney Jr.'s acting, going back to the 3 o'clock after-school horror films that were shown on the local television network. I know Chaney Jr. had a lot of personal problems, and this seems to show in his acting. Junior was the son of legendary actor Lon Chaney of such films as The Phantom of the Opera, 1925, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, 1923, and another 160 movies. Junior was born in 1906 in Oklahoma City while his family was on a theatrical tour. He eventually tried stage work and did okay. In 1935, his name was changed to Lon Chaney Jr. He was on his way even though he never cared for being called Junior. Although he began appearing in films in 1922, Junior is best known for Union Pacific 1939, for playing Lenny in Of Mice and Men 1939, The Wolfman 1941, The Ghost of Frankenstein 1942, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman 1943, Son of Dracula 1943, where I gave him grief for playing a vampire, but in retrospect he was pretty good, The Mummy's Ghost 1944, House of Frankenstein, 1944, The Mummy's Curse, 1944, House of Dracula, 1945, Pillow of Death, 1945, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, 1948, High Noon, 1952, I Died a Thousand Times, 1955, and Television's The Monkees, 1966, as Lenny, Jr. died in 1973. Perhaps the greatest actor in this film was Claude Rains, who played Sir John Talbot, the father of Larry, a.k.a. the Wolfman. 
Raines was born in London in 1889 to an acting father. He began acting on stage at the age of 11. He moved to America in 1913 for theater work. However, when World War I broke out, he returned to England to serve in a Scottish regiment. After the war, he stayed in England and studied at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. He became a stage actor and even taught at the Royal Academy. Raines' first film was in 1920, but his second wasn't until 1933. Of course, it was the fantastic universal horror classic with the highest body count, The Invisible Man, 1933, with Reigns in the title role. His other roles include Anthony Adverse, 1936, The Prince and the Pauper, 1937, In the Adventures of Robin Hood, 1938, and The Seahawk, 1940. Reigns played a couple of real slimy roles. In Robin Hood, he was so slippery that it makes you want to go to the backyard and start practicing your bow skills. Between the two previously mentioned roles, he was a leading character in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, 1939. As good as Mr. Smith, played by Jimmy Stewart, was, Reigns, playing Senator Joseph Payne, is just as evil. He is evil, but he was good, and maybe he could be good again. He continued with Here Comes Mr. Jordan, 1941, The Wolfman, 1941. Reigns is probably best known for the movie Casablanca, 1942, where he utters the line, Major Strasser's been shot, round up the usual suspects. And I'm shocked, shocked to find out gambling is going on in here, as he has handed his winnings. He was also the principal of Humphrey Bogart's line, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. His body of work continued with Phantom of the Opera, 1943, Passage to Marseille, 1944, and Mr. Skeffington, 1944. Though this last film is not my favorite genre, it is an excellent love story. Reigns was nominated for a Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his work in this movie. He was great in the epic tights and fights film Caesar and Cleopatra 1945. In what I believe was his best performance, Reigns played a Nazi agent opposite co-stars Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman in Notorious 1946. This is a spy thriller set in Rio de Janeiro at the end of World War II with lots of Nazis and other unsavory characters. Reigns and the others burned up the screen. He appeared in the fantasy Angel on My Shoulder, 1946, and the Jurassic Adventure of the Lost World, accompanied by a woman in pink pants. His next important role was in the epic Lawrence of Arabia, 1962. It's long, but totally worth the time. His final film was The Greatest Story Ever Told, 1965. Reigns died in 1967. Veteran actor Ralph Bellamy played Colonel Paul Monfort, the local chief constable. This American actor seems out of place here. They invented an explanation for why Larry had an English father and spoke with an American accent. Nothing for Mumford. Maria Opinskaya was cast as Maliva, the gypsy and mother of Bella. Opinskaya was a 90-pound dynamo who was born and trained in Russia. She had a great stage career and only started doing movies to keep her drama school going. She was a devout astrologer and in many ways, echoed the part she played. Opinskaya was only six years older than Bella Lugosi, who played her son. Two other actors helped carry the storyline of this movie. They are Bella Lugosi as Bella, very creative, and the beautiful Evelyn Anchors as Lawrence Talbot's love interest, Gwen Conliffe. Because of the role she took on, Anchors was known as the Queen of the Screamers way before Jamie Lee Curtis, but after Fay Ray. Story. The credits roll over a fog-shrouded forest, all in black and white. Then a hand opens an encyclopedia to a listing of lycanthropy, a.k.a. werewolfism. The legend states it is a disease of the mind. However, others, including those living near Talbot Castle, believe that a man takes the form of a wolf and violently kills. It also states that the sign of the werewolf is the pentagram, a five-pointed star. One thing that this movie doesn't cover is that were is an old English word for man, so werewolf literally means man-wolf. Lawrence, Larry Talbot, Lon Chaney Jr. is being driven to Talbot Castle in Land Willie Wales, his once home. The castle is really a large estate, not a true castle. He is greeted at the estate by his father, Sir John Talbot, Claude Rains. Sir John introduces Larry to Paul Monfort, Ralph Bellamy, who is the area's chief constable. Larry and Monfort were childhood friends. The mood darkens as Larry looks at a portrait of his recently deceased brother, John. Sir Talbot is saddened and talks of not being close to Larry as John was the elder son. 
He then says John, who looks exactly like Larry, was killed in a hunting accident. They never mention this again. Larry had been away from home for 18 years. As they talk of reconciliation, the staff brings in a new part for Sir Talbot's telescope. Sir Talbot and Larry go up to the observatory where a large telescope is housed in a glass room to allow observation. Larry goes to work installing the new part. Larry tells his father that he worked in an optical company in America and spent a large amount of time working at Mount Wilson Observatory. This explains why the son of a Welshman had an American accent. In the original version of the script, writer Kurt Siodmak had Larry come to Talbot Castle to repair the telescope, but he was not related to Sir Talbot. Sir Talbot leaves the observatory and Larry begins looking through the telescope. His gaze lands on the lovely young woman, Gwen Conliffe, Evelyn Anchors, in her bedroom trying on jewelry. Conliffe is an Anglo-Saxon name that means war love. This also plays on the dualistic nature of the Wolfman being at war with himself and with the ones he loves. Quinn tries on quarter moon earrings with spangles. This seems to foretell a peaceful time without the full moon, and the spangles may be the foretelling of the arrival of the gypsies. Larry dresses and goes to the store where Glenn works. When he tells her that he's looking for the earrings that are in her room, the conversation gets a little tense. Larry changes the subject to buying a cane when Gwen says she is going to get her father. Larry calms her by telling her he is psychic about the earrings. She offers him a cane with a dog head. Again, I believe this shows the contrast between a nice puppy and a mean old wolf. Larry picks a cane with a large silver wolf and the mark of a pentagram. Don't ever leave home without it. Gwen explains that the pentagram is the mark of a werewolf. She tells that a werewolf changes form a number of times a year. Larry comes back with, What big eyes you have, Grandma. Gwen replies that Little Red Riding Hood is also a werewolf story. She then recites the werewolf poem. Gwen continues that werewolves see the mark of the pentagram in the palm of his next victim's hand. Larry buys a cane and asks Gwen for a date. She flatly refuses. Gwen and Larry hear the gypsies arriving and go outside to look. Maliva, Maria Opinskaya, who is driving a two-wheel cart, looks to be as old as the hills. She was around 65. Her son Bella, Bella Lugosi, is driving a wagon. They spent a lot of time creating the name for that character. Bella was around 59 at the time of the movie, just six years younger than the woman playing his mother. Gypsies are itinerant entertainers believed to have migrated from the Indian subcontinent around a thousand years ago and settled in the Balkans in the 13th or 14th century. The name Gypsy may be derived from a shortening of Egyptian. However, they are now properly called Romani, reflecting their recent habitation in Romania. Is it odd that they come from the same place as Dracula? Gwen tells Larry that the gypsies are fortune tellers. Larry says he will be by to pick her up at eight. She says no for a second time. Larry returns home and meets with Sir Talbot. Sir Talbot confirms the story and says there is probably some truth to the werewolf legend. Sir Talbot then recites the poem. Sir Talbot encourages Larry to get to know the people as he will be their town overlord one day. The night is shrouded with fog. Gwen comes out of her shop at 8 p.m. and Larry is waiting. She has on the earrings and Larry has the cane. Don't leave home without it. He begs her to go to the gypsy camp with him. She consents, but then reveals her friend, Jenny, Faye Helm, who will be going along with the couple. The trio head into the dark woods. The fog is hanging low to the ground. Jenny picks some wolfbane and recites the werewolf poem. They arrive at the camp and are greeted by Bella. Maliva is moving around in the background. Jenny goes to get her fortune told while Larry cons Gwen into going for a lonely walk in the dark woods. He confesses about the telescope. She takes it reasonably well. Gwen tells that she is engaged to be married. Bella's reading for Jenny goes bad as Bella stops and begins rubbing his head. He has a pentagram on his forehead. Bella sees the pentagram in Jenny's palm. He tells her to come back the next night. He scares Jenny and she runs away. Maliva watches from her tent as Bella begins to transform. The horses are freaking out. Jenny is shown running through the woods and the werewolf howl is heard for the first time. 
Gwen and Larry hear the howl and Jenny scream. Larry tells Gwen to wait alone while he investigates. <coughs> nope, uh-uh, not gonna happen. Nope, not staying here by myself. A wolf is shown attacking Jenny and Larry runs in, striking the animal with his silver tip cane. The wolf that Larry fights is the actor's own German Shepherd. Larry kills the wolf, but is bitten in the process. He staggers away and is found by Gwen. Just a little comment here. Maliva and Bella knew he was a werewolf. Wouldn't it have been a good idea to delay their arrival by one day? Maliva arrives with her two-wheel cart. Gwen tells that Larry was bitten by a wolf. Maliva helps Larry get home. Sir Talbot and Constable Monford are drinking at the estate when the wounded Larry is brought inside. Maliva ducks out. Larry remembers Jenny, and at the same time, a man arrives to tell Constable Monford that Jenny has been murdered. The constable, Dr. Lloyd, Warren William, and some of the other villagers find Jenny in the woods, and Dr. Lloyd determines that she was bitten in the jugular by a large animal. They soon find Bella in human form. The doctor determines that Bella was beaten to death with a heavy object. He notes that Bella isn't wearing shoes. At last, they find Larry's silver-tipped werewolf cane. Wolf tracks are found near the bodies. Larry wakes in bed and is soon disturbed by the arrival of Sir Talbot, Constable Monfort, and Dr. Lloyd. They have Larry's cane and want to know if it is his. Larry identifies the cane as the one he killed the wolf with. Sir Talbot tells that the cane was found by Bella's dead body. Larry replies that he fought a wolf, not a man. He opens his robe to show the wounds, but he is completely healed. They decide they will interview Larry later. Rich privilege. Sir Talbert thinks Larry killed Bella by accident. Dr. Lloyd thinks Larry might be mentally shocked by the event. Bella's casket is shown being transported through town. Larry watches as locals begin to speculate about Larry killing him. The casket is taken to a cemetery nave adjacent to the cemetery. Larry opens the coffin but shuts it quickly when he hears voices. Maliva tells the priest that no prayer should be performed at Bella's burial. The priest is very concerned that what the gypsies want is a pagan ceremony. Maliva goes to the casket for viewing and talks cryptically about Bella's cursed life and how he will suffer no more. Larry stays hidden until Maliva leaves. Gwen discusses the night's events with her father. She is very upset. Jenny's mother and some church ladies come in and rage at Gwen's father because Gwen left Jenny alone. Larry busts in and the ladies retreat. Larry apologizes and said nothing wrong was done by the pair. Larry and Gwen talk, and he gives his version of the night and the possible killing of Bella. Gwen's fiancé, Frank Andrews, Patrick Knowles, arrives, but he is not very happy. Frank's dog barks at Larry. Frank is Sir Talbot's gamekeeper. Larry leaves. Frank alludes to the tragedy being associated with the Talbot family line. On another night, Gwen and Frank visit the gypsy camp. It is booming with throngs of gypsies and villagers this time. There is dancing and music, and the tone is different from Gwen and Larry's first visit. Larry is also in attendance with his silver cane in hand. Larry leaves when he sees the pair. However, Frank asks Larry to join the couple. The trio go to a shooting gallery, and everything is fine until a wolf target pops up. Frank says to Larry, shoot him before he bites you. Larry, now visibly shaken, misses the shot. Frank easily shoots the wolf target. Is that foreshadowing? Larry heads away alone, but encounters Moliva near a wagon. She takes Larry into her tent and tells him he killed a wolf, and the wolf was her son Bella in werewolf form. She explains that werewolves can be killed with silver, which is why the cane worked. She gives him a pentagram chain that she says can break the curse. Larry doesn't want to believe and heads out. Moliva calmly states that whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives will become a werewolf. She warns Larry to wear the charm over his heart. She then tells him to go and says that may heaven help him. Constable Monfort has been watching the goings-on from a distance. Maliva tells another gypsy about Larry. As the word spreads through the camp, they all start packing to leave. 
Frank gets angry and leaves, so Gwen is alone. She is surprised to see the pentagram on the charm and is shocked when Larry says that Maliva said he was a werewolf. He gives Gwen the charm for her protection. He then gives her a kiss, but they are disturbed by the gypsies packing. Larry asks a man why they are leaving, and the man says a werewolf is in the camp. Well, the gypsies are all leaving. I must go, too. But Gwen! Hey, 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 what's all the excitement? There's a werewolf in camp. Gwen runs away, and Larry has a dream sequence of the recent events. Larry runs home to his room and checks for hair growth. His feet and legs are the first part to turn hairy as he begins the transformation. This is a very good trivia question. Larry fully transforms into a werewolf, but it's not shown. He howls and then kills a nighttime grave digger. <laughs> the people in the village are awakened by the howling. Constable Monfort and Dr. Lloyd meet in the cemetery. The gravedigger was killed in the same manner as Jenny. They also find wolf tracks in the dirt. In the morning, muddy wolf tracks are leading into Larry's room. Larry has a pentagram mark where he was bitten. He tries to wipe away the tracks, but sees Constable Monfort following the tracks towards his room. Larry tries to play cool with his father about the tracks. Larry then asks about the werewolf lore. Sir Talbot explains that the myth exists in almost every country in the world and it is some type of schizophrenia where the evil in a man's soul takes on the form of an animal. Sir Talbot believes that these actions take place in the mind and there is no physical form of an animal. They decide to go to church. However, the church steps seem much too large for a small town. This was actually shot on a universal set created for the Hunchback of Notre Dame, 1923, in which Lon Chaney Sr. played Quasimodo. The villagers are really spreading the tea. Larry and Sir Talbot have an awkward encounter with Gwen and her father on the steps of the church. The entire congregation looks at Larry as he stands in the back before ducking out. Sir Talbot, Constable Monfort, Frank, and Dr. Lloyd are at Castle Talbot discussing the killings when Larry arrives. Larry says it is not a wolf, but a true werewolf. Constable Monfort mocks Larry by calling for a werewolf hunt. Dr. Lloyd thinks the killings are a result of a mental problem. When the others leave, Dr. Lloyd tells Sir Talbot that Larry should be confined to a mental hospital for rest. Frank and Constable Monfort have men set out steel traps around the area. At night, the werewolf howl is heard again. Werewolf feet are shown walking through the woods. The werewolf steps into one of the traps and is caught. Men and dogs are coming through the woods in the monster's direction. The dogs lose the trail for a moment. Maliva arrives in her two-wheeled cart. She says words over the werewolf, and he reverts back to Larry. Larry flees, but is stopped by a couple of searchers. He bluffs his way out, but Constable Mumford is on the trail. Larry goes to Gwen's door and wakes her by throwing rocks against the windows. She lets Larry inside the store. He says he is going away and can't take her along. Gwen is in love with Larry, but he sees the pentagram mark on her palm. Larry goes home and tells his father, Sir Talbot, that he is a werewolf. They hear the dogs and the men hunting in the woods. Larry begins to realize that the only way out is to die. Sir Talbot ties Larry to a chair so he can't go out. Sir Talbot has to leave Larry to meet with the hunters. Larry has him take the silver cane. Constable Monfort, Frank, and Dr. Lloyd are waiting in the woods with rifles. Sir Talbot leaves the other men, but soon runs into Maliva, who tells Sir Talbot he is protected by the cane. They hear shooting, and Sir Talbot runs back to the hunting stand. Larry is moving around as a full werewolf. Gwen talks to Maliva, but refuses to go with the gypsy and runs into the woods. Have you seen Larry? Don't go through the woods. Why? Listen, the hunt is on. But, but I want to help him. You'd better come with me. Larry attacks Gwen.
Her screams are heard by the hunters. Sir Talbot arrives and fights the werewolf with the silver-tipped cane. Never leave home without it. Eventually, Sir Talbot kills the werewolf and it slowly transforms into Larry. Oliva says a chant over Larry and says he will now have peace. Your suffering is over. Now you will find peace for eternity. Sir Talbot can't believe what he is seeing. The hunters arrive and are shocked to see Larry dead. Constable Montfort says the wolf must have attacked Gwen and Larry saved her. The wolf must have attacked her and Larry came to the rescue. I'm sorry, Sir John. All right, if you're enjoying this and getting value out of it, be sure to subscribe, leave me a comment. It's greatly appreciated and it helps the channel grow. Conclusion. The Werewolf of London, 1935, is the first movie made about werewolves. There is a link in the description. In that film, a man is bitten by a Tibetan werewolf and thus becomes a werewolf. The effect can be held off by a night-glowing flower found only in Tibet. However, most werewolf lore came from today's movie, The Wolf Band, 1941. Both films have being bitten by a werewolf and living as the way to become a werewolf but they diverge greatly after that point. In The Werewolf of London, 1935, a werewolf is killed by regular bullets. The Wolfman, 1941, introduces silver as the killing agents for werewolves, although there may be some historical precedent. The pentagram in the palm of the next victim's hand was from today's movie. Also in this movie, the moon causes the werewolf to transform. However, what makes this movie really great is that Larry was sympathetically portrayed he was not a heartless killer, but a man who found himself in a bad fix. This represents humans struggling with their internal good and evil. More importantly, this film calls out the damn Nazis, as in how they could take a man that was basically good and turn him into an evil killer. I'm referring to the foot soldiers here and not the leadership. The pentagram is very similar to the Star of David that Jewish people in the Nazi-occupied areas were required to wear, pointing them out to be killed. Spooky, right? Jack Pierce was the makeup artist for this film and made the werewolf transformation one of the scariest things I ever saw as a youth. Pierce worked on Dracula 1931, Frankenstein 1931, White Zombie 1932, and The Mummy 1932. So I will credit this great makeup artist as the main contributor to any fever dreams I had as a child. In The Wolfman 1941, Pierce created new makeup techniques and prosthetics to create the werewolf. The director used repeated close-ups during the transformation, including 17 continuous face shots. Pierce was nominated for the Best Makeup Oscar. Silent film actor Gibson Gowan appeared in The Wolfman 1941 as a villager and was present at the death of the Wolfman, Jr. He had also been in The Phantom of the Opera 1925 and saw the death scene of The Phantom, Sr., he was the only actor to appear in death scenes performed by both Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr. This film was primarily shot on the Universal Studios lot in Southern California. During the final scene, after Larry attacks her, Gwen faints and lies in the smoke or fog. When they finish the scene, the actress, Evelyn Ankers, was found passed out because of the smoke. World famous short summary, a rich boy returns to the country and falls for a girl. Things end badly for the boy. If you enjoyed this and got value out of the show, please subscribe and you'll get notifications when new content comes out. It also really helps the show get found. If you want to see more information of the citations, jump over to the site at classicmoviereb.com. Beware the moors. Some boxes will pop up here. One is a classic horror film and the other is a playlist for classic horror films. Check them out and keep your cane with you all the time.